first one of 2019. Our theme is Laugh at My Love Life. I am your host, Cupid. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Now, let me explain a few things to you humans because y'all just don't get it. I just take my little arrow, bing, 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 bing. I don't care where they land, I don't care where they fly. Because Cupid don't give a fuck, that's me. Sometimes you think that my arrows has misfired. They didn't misfire, you just gotta deal with it, you know? Because again, rule number one, Cupid don't give a fuck. I don't care where they go, <laughs> where they land. Have you ever been out on a date, like the first date, and you're like, why did I think this person was attractive? Or you're a little bit longer in a relationship, it's like, wow, what did I first see? Here's the thing. Some of my arrows are fast acting, some of them are slow acting. I just take whatever's in my quiver, bing, 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 and it doesn't matter for me. So, let me explain that about the arrows. Now, I don't know if you guys know my backstory, but my mother's name is Venus, my father's name is Mars. We're in love, we're in war, come together, in the quiver, ping, 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 and you wacky humans have to deal with it. Yes. Isn't that great? That's exciting. So, like I like to say in this business, one person's heartache is another person's punchline. So, <laughs> that's why we are here to hear some stories, even if they're not laugh out loud funny. They're, ooh, thank God that hasn't happened to me. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know about me not giving a damn which arrow I hit what with, right? So, hasn't happened to you yet. So, if a laugh gets caught in your throat, it's like, yeah, <laughs> it's on its way. So, our first roulette is going to tell us about one of the age old dating dilemmas. Please welcome R.G. Hook. <laughs> Okay, so this is in two parts. Uh, I'll read the first part now, and then after intermission will be the second part. It was October, and I had been living in Kitty Hawk for the last two months. On the Outer Banks, a series of barrier islands on the Atlantic Ocean, off the mainland of North Carolina. Most mornings, I ran a four-mile stretch down the asphalt beach road returning directly on the shore itself until I hit the back door of my sandy porch of the dreamlike Ocean View Cottage, a treat to myself on this year-long riding my heart out back to Healy road trip sabbatical. My co-pilot on this journey was Gadita the cat. One morning, I stopped to talk to a neighbor down the beach road. He asked if I'd heard about the peeping Tom and Kitty Hawk. The peeper had been arrested, then released out on bail until his trial. And as far as his neighbor knew, he had left Kitty Hawk and was staying with family in Virginia Beach. I hadn't thought any more of that peeper conversation until that evening, around 10 o'clock, when I saw a bouncing beam of light on the sand trail leading down the dune towards the water. I kept my eyes glued to the pattern of light until I could make out a figure. After some time, he returned to the dune and began a trek back towards the street. It was then that I saw he was holding a leash with a small dog at the end of it. When he neared my house, I turned on my porch lights as a warning of what? That I was armed with a psychotic cat? <laughs> he finished his walk until he reached the street, then crossed and disappeared towards the beach houses one street over. The next afternoon, I watched as a man I had not seen before walked that same path from the beach road to the shore with a small dog, part terrier, part chihuahua, again on a leash. This being the off-season for Kitty Hawk meant that new faces on the beach were tourists, not locals, or long-timers like me. Because my back porch faced the Atlantic, Gadita and I could people watch from inside through the large bay window. I wanted to see this man's face in case I needed to identify it later for the police. <laughs> Under the pretense of offering his dog a bowl of water, in case he's thirsty, I said, I walked down my sandy steps and across the beach to introduce myself, <coughs> make mental notes of this man's dark hair and eye color, approximate height, and any other details I thought a crime scene investigator would need <laughs> to solve the mystery of my murder. <coughs> After the terrier lapped the bowl dry, the guy approached my deck and apologized for scaring me the night before. I saw you turn on your lights, he said. I told him about the peeping Tom, and he remarked how lucky he was that I hadn't called the police. I asked if he'd seen my license plates. 
He nodded. Yeah, Texas. I gave him my best dead shark eyes as I said, I don't dial 911. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a gun, he laughed. But I remained stone faced with my best Ted Bundy, Ted Bundy smile. <laughs> there were no safety locks on the doors of my beach house. The only true weapons were my body odor after a long run <laughs> and Yadita's fish breath. He offered that he was staying at his sister's Oceanside Vacation House, one street over. She'd asked him to drive in from Philadelphia to check on some work being done. When he continued to stand on my deck, steps talking, I invited him to sit. I asked about the book he was reading, Self Help. He confessed to being lost in a life transition, even admitted to being full of fear. I couldn't help reaching for my invisible coach's hat while I began asking questions. But after a while, I said I need to get back inside. Before he left, he asked me out to dinner. I declined and invited him to come over instead because that's what one does when they like a person's smile who may or may not be a peeping Tom, a date raper, or a murderer. <laughs> I really did think that inviting a stranger over was far safer than getting into his oversized four-wheel drive because apparently I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and it was now two years since my husband had passed, so that an hour before this first date arrived back at the beach house, I walked out to the ocean and whispered, I owe this to myself. When Mark, let's call him Mark, because honestly, I do not remember his name, <laughs> arrived that evening, I asked to take a photo of his driver's license, <laughs> then texted this to a friend, <laughs> so she could help the police identify my killer, too. <laughs> After welcoming him in and putting the six-pack he showed up with in the refrigerator, I began to explain how I didn't really cook, but that we wouldn't starve if he liked chicken and rice. Uh -huh. The smell from the not really cooking was that of cumin and garlic and green peppers. So, Mark said as he studied my face, are you Latino? Really? <laughs> Is this what he's going to open with? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss my dead husband. <laughs> I took a deep breath before I responded. Do you want to know what the first question my husband asked me on our first date? I didn't wait for him to respond. First he asked how old I was. <laughs> then he asked if I wanted to have children. <laughs> oh, Mark said, so this is the first date. I wasn't sure. Wow, this guy is even dumber than me. <laughs> I probably would have been less annoyed by his question if it hadn't been the first damn question every person on that island asked as soon as I introduced myself. I could not imagine asking this question to every person I ever met unless we were specifically talking about ancestry and ethnicities. So you're not Latino then, he said. Oh my god. Ah, <laughs> oh, I said, it's Latina. <laughs> then I continued, continued, and you are what? <laughs> he rattled off a series of Western European ethnicities, then finished with, and I'm one-eighth Cherokee. <laughs> I actually laughed out loud. No, you're not Native American. I've got Native blood, but there is absolutely nothing Native about you. He insisted that he was, but I continued to laugh as I cracked, cracked open a bottle of Prosecco because I was pretty sure this was going to be a long evening. <laughs> I'd forgotten that my red beach towel was hanging on the back of a dining room chair. It was from the movie Gone with the Wind. This is embarrassing, I said as I grabbed the towel and tossed it in another, in another room. But he'd already seen it. I like that movie too, he said. Yeah, I agree, but I don't want people to know that I like it. <laughs> when a look of confusion crossed his face, I said, because of the whole romanticizing the slavery thing? As we sat down to eat, he mumbled, Slavery wasn't as bad as people made it out to be. I laughed even harder until I really realized, oh my God, he's serious. But he wasn't finished. Their own leaders sold them. They helped the slave traders. That didn't make it okay, I said. It was still wrong regardless of who was doing it. He shrugged his shoulders as he said that he didn't know why people were complaining about things now when before it was okay. I stared at him. I'd heard about people like this, but I'd never actually met one of them up close. It was never okay, I said. 
That's the problem. Oh, yes. Yes, this was definitely going to be a long <laughs> evening. That is the end of part one. <laughs>